Hello, and welcome to this incredibly exciting How To Academy event. I'm Ada Wordsworth, and it's my honor to introduce our two speakers for this evening. Slavoj Žižek is one of the most influential thinkers of our time, a psychoanalytical philosopher, critic, self-described complicated communist and political theorist, Zizek is no stranger to either high or low culture. From describing tulips as dental vaginas, to modern ideology as a kind of unfreedom, which he experiences freedom, Zizek has views on every issue under the sun, all injected with the Hegelian Marxist philosophy he follows. Will Self is perhaps the coolest British novelist, journalist, and political theorist of the 21st century. Like Zizek, Self is no stranger to controversy, describing George Orwell as, English, as England's supreme mediocrity and calling free speech a Western sexual fetish. <laughs> Nonetheless, his many performances on panel shows such as Question Time, interrogating the status quo, have captured the heart of the nation with one viewer commenting that he is the voice of reason and compassion. In a world of political chaos and uncertainty, Self and Zizek's political commentaries shine through as beacons of intelligence and understanding, and we are extremely honored to have them here today. Please give a warm round of applause for Will Self and Slavoj Zizek. If I, okay, if I do or do not need this, I will hold it in my hand. You, you don't need that. Ah, oh, then it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will really try to be short because a lively debate is much better than boring introductions. So I will just say, introduce my new book. What I, you may have noticed, some of you, that I don't really care about it, but that lately I'm in big trouble, by the, attacked by the right-wingers, even by the left-wingers, and we can see exactly, we can isolate six, seven points where I am in trouble. First, there is uh, my Eurocentrism, because of it I was even accused of being close to Le Pen or whatever and so on. My racism. Then, my, uh, my celebration of violence. I am as Simon Critchley put it, a weak coward who is dreaming of some revengeful great violence and so on. Then I was wrong about Greece, that I didn't support Grexit. Then I was wrong about refugees. Again, my brutal Eurocentric racism came out. Then I was wrong about LGBT. My, again, my fascism, but especially my homophobia and so on came out there. And finally, I've shown my cards openly by supporting Donald Trump. <laughs> now, things are clear. Uh, in this book, I simply try to, but I didn't want to do this retroactively, I noticed. I try to elaborate my position on all these points. So, by the book, I will not talk about this, but just briefly about what preoccupies me. First, okay, what really preoccupies me is Hegel, Lacan, ideology, and so on, and I'm even very conservative here. People always dismiss me as some kind of crazy postmodernist. No, I think somewhere between Kant and Hegel, everything that had to happen, happens, and now with Marx things go, already with Marx things go just down, so we have to return from Marx to Hegel and so on. But what fascinates me is first ideology today. I think we live in an extremely interesting area where ideology more and more functions and in this way its mystifying power is even stronger. It functions as a weird mode of uh, critique of ideology. Today's predominant ideology, I claim, is not 
is no longer accept with fundamentalists, but it's another question, so-called religious fundamentalists, how they work. It's something like, if I try to describe it, don't take things too seriously, don't trust big projects, it's all just a vague dream, try to get out of your life what you can, don't engage yourself too much, and so on and so on. Uh, what this brings us to is, and this always intrigued me, two things. First, uh, uh, first, the strange status of beliefs today, as I developed widely in most of my books, more and more we believe through others. If you ask a typical, even in working class, not only in so-called middle classes, a guy today or a lady, do you believe in God? You would get something like, not really, but. I go to the ritual and then you have different, out of respect for my culture, uh, not to offend my children or whatever and so on and so on. And you can develop this to the end. If you ask children, do you really believe? They would, of course, have told you, I just pretend for the sake of my parents to get the present. No, so we really have this paradox of beliefs which function socially without any subject in the first person believing in them. So in a way, I'm not saying we are a godless atheist, uh, live in a godless atheist era. Maybe we believe more than ever, but in this uh, displaced way. And this always fascinated me, how beliefs actually function. Maybe the very idea of this heroic first-person belief, I believe, is something modern. I think it begins only with, we are celebrating 500 years this year, uh, Luther, with Protestantism. I don't think in medieval times they really believed in any literal sense. Okay, first point. Second point about ideology that uh, fascinates me is how every ideological edifice, in order to be operative, needs a set of unwritten, usually obscene rules. Ideology is not just what it says. Ideology is always a set of rules which regulate not only how you can, but how are you even expected to violate the explicit rules. To be a member of a community, it's not enough to know the rules. It's to know how to violate the rules. My first experience of this was, of course, the socialist Yugoslavia, my youth. And then I noticed everywhere around the world, you have it. And this is always was so fascinating for me, how what appears to be a transgression, as postmodernists would have put it, sites of resistance to ruling ideology, it's really its stronger, strongest constitutive part. This obscene rituals, it can be sexual, power play, humiliating, but I don't have to teach you about this. I think your English, this, how do you call them, schools, boarding schools, aren't they a kingdom of this? Yes. Uh, it explains everything about it. Everything, yes. Yeah. Second topic that interests me is violence. I'm here usually accused of some fascination with violence. No, I just like to point out a couple of things. First is that, uh, you know, violence for me is not just what we perceive as direct violence. Usually we associate violence with change. And then the topic is, we need change, but should we do it in a violent way or not, and so on and so on. Well, my first thing would be, but are we aware how much violence is needed and is done, practiced, just for the things to go on the way they are? That's why I find it so hypocritical the way our media report on violence. For example, it is reported, but underreported. Take Yemen today. It's constantly bombarded by Saudi Arabia with uh, Americans agreeing it. My God, the country is practically, take Democratic Republic of Congo and so on. I told my Palestinian friends when I was in Ramallah, you live in a paradise compared with Congo. So how much violence is going on? Second thing, you, now, I will do it to provoke you. Uh, uh, 
I, at a certain level, which violence, we can go later into it, I'm ready to condone. Okay, to provoke you. I am ready under certain conditions, which I will precisely describe, to kill a man who did never kill another person, but was just doing his job. And I met such a man. Years ago in Argentina, relative of my ex-wife, blah, blah, I met a doctor who confessed to me, and I was so disgusted, that uh, when there was military dictatorship there, he worked for the secret police. They had a prisoner whom they wanted to torture. And his job of that doctor, relative of distant relative of my, my, my wife, was to examine that prisoner and then give a precise analysis. You can do this to this guy and he will not suffer consequences. If you then don't care if he suffocates a little bit of a couple of bones broken, you can do this, but don't torture him too much in that way because his lungs are weak and so on and so on. I find this so disgusting because he at the same time emphasized, listen, I just gave my opinion. I didn't do anything. If I were to be sitting at a table with him and somehow magically a little capsule of poison in my hand, and I look around, there is nobody looking at it, I would be ready to poison him. <laughs> One, another example. Can you imagine supporting a call to military resistance against a legal government which undoubtedly has the support of the majority of population? I can. And you would even agree when you, I tell you whom. Charles de Gaulle in 1940. Are you aware that from a legal standpoint, Marshal Petain was the Assemblée Nationale moved to the south when German, and he was elected uh, by the majority. Not only this, all agree, even communists, that if there were to be free elections in France till 42, Petain would have been re-elected with 90%. But I think de Gaulle did the right thing. It was totally illegal. He called to resistance and so on. So there are examples where I am ready. They're not very good examples, are they? Sorry? I mean, they're, they're not the sort of violence that your critics accuse you of endorsing. Nobody's accused you. Ah, that's nice. Of, so we begin. Okay, yeah. let's go here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because I hope that I will provoke you here. Yes. Okay. I'm not, that, back. I'm not that provoked. I mean, I'm not raised to violence, but your examples aren't very good. I mean, they're, they're a kind of knocking off a kind of Argentinian torturer with a secret vial of poison, or historically counterfactually censuring de Gaulle and supporting Pétain. This is not the kind of violence you're accused, your accusers say you then condone. Then tell me what I'm accused of. The kind of, of violence your, your, your yeah. accusers uh, hold you guilty of, of in a numinous way supporting is the idea that the revolutionary moment needs to be seized and possibly pressed home by violent means. And the ghost of this does kind of yeah. lurk around the courage yeah. of hopelessness. I mean, perhaps you can take well, us... Because I claim, okay, maybe I'm wrong, and it's, I agree with you, let's be British empiricists. Mm. This is a question which can be decided <laughs> with concrete textual references yes, are yes, to a point. Yes. So give me an example. Oh, well, I mean, you, you quote, uh, there's, there's an argument, I would say, in The Courage of Hopelessness yeah. that goes from, for example, a quote very late on where you quote Mao, where, saying, in the kingdom of heaven, everything is in chaos, excellent, or something like that. Yes. Yeah. So conditions of chaos, of, of social disintegration, ideological complexity, <laughs> represent to you a break point. This is a point where we should carpe diem, we must seize the day, yes? Yes. Where and do you see here any... Uh, yeah. First, we don't do it. Situation is chaotic. Yes. Why not seize the opportunity to do something good then? Yes. But, it, but it, each point in the text, which is... I, I enjoyed the book very much, yeah. by the way, and found it a, a mm. rollicking good read. Give me this in one sentence is. so that we repent it. Will self, I enjoyed the book very yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, no, I, think, then, <laughs> I, I actually think the cover blurb on the paperback will be a rollicking good read. Um, and then yeah. unstoppable, uh, yeah, yeah. undownputable, what are these yes. strange words? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. 
but the book is really a sustained critique of a kind of left liberal position that still wishes to reside in a kind of democratic formula where power is transferred without regime change of any kind. Now, I'm not saying at any point in the book do you actively advocate violence, but it's always on the table. It's always there as a possibility. And you very strongly adjure, and I'd say that the left liberals are your main thing that you're attacking. You're not expecting your book to be read by right-wingers who are going to throw up their hands. Well, I am accused, oh, as you know. Slavo is right, after all. We Don't you know that one of the mean guys around Trump was it Richard Bannon of who? Mm. Did say that I'm his favorite Marxist, but that's his another. Favorite. <laughs> his favorite Marxist, so he's got more than one, right? <laughs> but you wouldn't deny that you, I'm not saying you condone violence, but it's on the table. Yeah, absolutely. And why not? It, it, I'm not calling for whatever violence and so on. Don't forget it in my viol, vi book on violence. Mm. I end up with saying that sometimes the most violent thing is to do nothing. To yep. abstain. And I quote, I still love that example, I love it, even mm. more than your book of Dave, mm. uh, that Saramago novel, is it blindness or no seeing, the mm. art of seeing, mm. where a total crisis explodes when people simply refuse to vote and so No, you know what's my view here? I will tell you. It's not celebration of violence, it's this one. When things go, and that's how I read Mao, when, and incidentally with Mao, I'm far from celebrating it, like Alain Badiou almost broke all contact with me because of that introduction to Mao, where I also praise Mao, but also show some, but, okay, my point is this one. When there is an open, difficult situation, confusion and so on, the point is not to lose nerves, but to grab a chance there. Mm. And I'm not celebrating it. I know it. Mm. Listen, I don't know if you did. And still but now... Listen, I wait a minute, Slava, before you, before you even get there, right at the beginning, in your last book, actually, before this, on violence, you talk about this idea, and you mentioned it before, of what we, we, we call systemic violence. Okay? Yes. So everybody in this hall, for example, you would surely say is guilty of participating in that systemic violence. No. Every, everybody's got a mobile phone in their pocket with a no. bit of coal tan in it. Wait a minute, it. I don't say no? this and precisely... Well, surely, surely you wait do. Wait a minute, if I say systemic, I don't mean we are all guilty, because now you talk like, uh, like those ideologists of ecology mm. who instead of demanding for the systemic change, I hope we will agree here, try to obfuscate the situation by treating us individually. Like, mm. you know, who are you to criticize the system? Mm. What did you do? Did you put aside all cokes of can? Did you separate? Mm. So I'm not trying to make people feel guilty. Absolutely. What, like, what? we are all part of it. No, we are not all and part of it. And you'd see that as a liberal creed occur. We're all to blame, one to be pushed to one side. But nonetheless, everybody's got a bit of coal tan in their pocket. Everybody is paying their taxes to the British government who, deal the Al who did their Al Yamama deal I'm with Saudi no Arabia. No problem. You, you mentioned the current bombing in Saudi Arabia. Everybody in this auditorium is contributing to the Saudis being able to undertake that bombing. So I don't understand why you don't see us, not individually, mm. but collectively responsible for this systemic violence. We are responsible just more in this active, passive sense of tolerating it. Yeah. We know it, right. we know it, but we nonetheless, you know what, ah, here, hypocrisy enters, and I expect you even to... It's the native land of the hypocrite, so, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, no, even to, uh, I expect you even to agree with it. You know, uh, when there were all, the, all those disclosures, uh, what were that prison, Abu Ghraib or whatever, yeah, Abu Ghraib. all that stuff, I read a very good leftist analysis in American press where they say people were shocked. But it wasn't, oh my God, horrors are happening there on behalf of democracy. It was more, they should do it, but discreetly. We don't want to know about it. Mm. That's our predominant hypocrisy. Mm. And I don't have any great, you know, that brings me with trouble, into trouble with some leftists, mm. where I said, okay, I don't trust in experts. There is no expert ruling class elite which knows mm. what is happening. But mm. I also don't trust ordinary people. The thing is, when I read your stuff, 
Do you trust them? Trust ordinary people. Yeah. I, I believe in the wisdom of whores. Uh, <laughs> But your work looks to me often like, you know, traité de savoir-faire pour, pour les jeunes gens. I mean, it looks to me, by Raoul Weinigen, it looks to me like an advocacy of a certain position. And I think there are young people here, I can see them in the audience, young people with coltan in their pocket, who do look to you as somebody to propose positive actions that people can But undertake don't. now. Tell me one Very rarely did I express admiration or engage myself. I did it up to a point with Syriza. Already with Podemos, uh, 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 uh. I have in Latin America, I never fell into Chavez mm. things. I have still now a certain sympathy, I think they are the wisest, for Bolivia, not so much Morales as Linera, his mm. vice president. As you can see, they do a very reasonable politics, rationally, it's the best rational left. There was modest progress and so on. Mm. So wait a minute, I'm very careful here. Well, This but, is why, um, incidentally, many people are frustrated by me. I'm not they talking, said all the criticism, but where is the action plan? I'm not plan? talking about a, a partisan program. Yes. I'm talking, talking about the thrust of your critique of the uh, liberal humanists, the liberal bourgeois position, suggests that you should offer some course of action for people to take. What we have in the courage of hopelessness mm -hmm. is kind of, don't just do something, sit there. And, and the quote about Lenin and his mistress, learn, learn, learn. I love that. Learn, oh, learn, and learn. That, in, okay. in that sense, when people ask me in what sense I am a Leninist, mm. I say, in, no, but you know where I So is that what we should do? Just learn, learn, and learn, not get rid of what, the culture. Why are you so people. ironic here? I think, yes. Well, we are in England, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> what I mean, sorry, is this. You know, I hate these proverbs, and I hope we agree that mm. proverbs are one of the greatest domains of stupidity, no? Mm. I mean, in the sense of whatever you do, you can cover it up with a proverb. Mm. Let's say I make a risky decision. Well, all's well that ends well. <laughs> yeah, that's one way. Or, or, for example, I'm in a risky position. I take a risk, I succeed. Mm. Then, I don't know what you have in England. In my language, you have a proverb which vaguely translated says, only those who risk can succeed. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah, but I take a risk and fail. Ah, I have another proverb. I like it, vulgar. You cannot urinate against the wind, which means mm. don't... You know, that's... So, no, I, I think I hate this proverb, enough talk, do something. Mm. Maybe, as I always repeat it, in the 20th century, We were trying to do too many things. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Yours is an inverted hom homily. It's don't just do something, sit there. Yes, you know, sit so there and think. Sit and there, talk. sit Which there. Because without this, we don't know what we are doing. Right, well, now I want to ask you about the sort of thinking we should be doing. Now, for example, in The Courage of Hopelessness, as in much of your other work, there are frequent references to Lacan. Yeah. Uh, and, and I want to know, I want to understand a little better. I mean, for example, should everybody here, I mean, I assume everybody here is deeply familiar with Lacan, right? <laughs> Just as you're deeply familiar with Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. That's not enough. No, I, there's me. a slight uneasiness now. <laughs> Common people, enough. taxi drivers like the one in your book of Dave, yes. read phenomenology. Yeah. But my types know the difference between first and second edition of Hegel's logic. Okay, okay but that's another. You will not get me so easily, you know. But I know what you wanted to You're say. You're applauding. Do you know the difference between the first and the second edition of Hegel's phenomenology? No, he's a good uh, communist, you know. Yeah. It's like <laughs> Comrade Stalin says something, says something, you applaud, you don't ask questions. No, no but sorry, let me be quite serious. It's, lo it's you... looking that way. Yeah, no, <laughs> let me be quite serious. Wouldn't you say that today, with what is happening, ecological crisis, uh, refugees, global crisis, and, but at the same time we have economic progress. On the top of it, biogenetics, what will this mean? We are entering a space where we don't really know what is happening, where we are going. It's time to think. Mm. Don't you agree? Uh, I do agree a lot, but why would one want to necessarily refer to a French psychoanalytic theorist whose main contribution was to vary the length of analytic sessions?
Maybe <laughs> the main uh, clinical, In order that yeah. he could make more cash, presumably. No, Why would I was spreading stories about Lacan, and we can go on here. Yeah, yeah. I love them. Like, no, but seriously, Slavoj, should these people really understand Lacan to this very, very high level? Okay, that, that I will give you... I mean, in yeah, order yeah. to... The, 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 their actual thinking about the predicament we're in should be in, informed I by Lacanian I will give you a precise ideas. answer. Of course who has time to read all of Lacan and so on, either don't... So what, we just look at you to produce no, your no, philosophical no, no, no. grab what bag I'm saying and is that, But let's be stuff. frank, let's mm. go concretely into mm. it. Mm. You know that it's clear from recent biographies that Mao didn't read not even one book by Marx and so on. No. Stalin didn't read anything, so mm. don't be afraid. What I want to say, no, to be very precise, why Lacan? I think that we are witnessing today many paradoxes in our love lives even. For example, it's a beautiful paradox that with all the permissivity you can do today this way, that way, with dogs, whatever you want, <laughs> the more our societies are permissive, the more there is frigidity, impotence, feeling of guilt, and so on and so on. As many friends who are real psychoanalysts tell me, today the main guilt feeling is no longer uh, I have illicit desires and I feel guilty, but I don't enjoy sex enough, I feel guilty for that, and so on. Mm. So where does this paradox come from? That people, uh, in some sense, counteract their liberation. They are not able to enjoy, uh, or politically. It's obvious that subordination itself brings some perverse pleasure, and so on. For all this, I think that still psychoanalysis gives the best instruments that we have. Yeah, but you could just read a couple of uh, essays by Freud, couldn't you? You could just read Beyond no, the Pleasure Principle. No, because he often and... didn't know what he is saying. And this is not a critique of Freud. It's with all great uh, inventors that in the first act you think you see something, but then you immediately... For example, my big example, death drive. Hmm. Freud immediately regresses because he brings it back to that pseudo-oriental stupidity, nirvana, the wish to disappear. But I think it can be so brilliantly shown, I did it in my book, I will not now, no, not brilliantly, but uh, simply, that what Freud calls uh, death drive is really some kind of obscene immortality. Hmm. My model for death drive is, I hope, no, you don't have, you are too intellectual for me. The same dirty pleasures of, for example, uh, undead zombie movies or video games. This is it, you know, you are dead but you are not dead. An obscene undeadness that exists and so on. And this is part, fundamental part of our culture today. We are obsessed with zombies. So, this is a side question. This I mean, is, I, I no, mean, no, it's not because this is how Freud produced a notion, death drive, and immediately misinterpreted The Freudian it. death drive, uh, am on avi, is, is the Schopenhauerian, you know, will and that was power. the greatest mistake. Freud yeah. was really okay. anti-Schopenhauer. No, that's not what really I'm asking yeah. you about. What I want to understand, because we're meant to go away and learn, 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 I want to understand how I am to fit your favoured theorists, Hegel, Lacan, mm. Marx to some extent, to some Freud extent, to yeah. some extent, how I am to fit them into my learning so that I'm going to understand what the fuck I should do about the shit we're in. <laughs> and that's what I'm not quite getting from you, man. Uh, <laughs> no, but I, I, okay, if you, again, it depends on what you will expect. I think, in a I mean, you know, I mean, I may why not do be, you I want mean, to act immediately? Why are you afraid to just try to understand what's going on. Okay. You so, are too much of a Marxist here. So you we, want, we, you, we're clear that we, we're not going to act. So, for example, on June... No, the, we can act. On June the 8th, we shouldn't vote at all. No. If you ask me, I would say either abstain or Corbyn. But with Corbyn, you know what makes me afraid? No, 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 wait a minute. I did engage myself of, like, Bernie Sanders. Mm. I you, think... you endorse Sanders in The Courage of Hopelessness. Yeah, but you know why? For a very precise reason. Because he did something unique. I hope we agree here. In the United States, this cultural left 
screwed it up with their obsessions and maybe this is a mythic category, maybe there is some truth in it. So-called ordinary working people, the only way for them to vent out to express their frustration was offered by Trump and that kind of people. Mm. And Bernie Sanders brought some fresh air here. He, it was a unique achievement. He succeeded in mobilizing those who would have otherwise voted for Trump. Mm. And the great tragedy of the Democratic Party, not only uh, 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 even now after elections, was, my God, instead of planning how to beat Trump, you know what they are doing now? They are renormalizing Trump. Nancy Pelosi said recently, oh, Trump is like Reagan, Bush, don't worry, for eight years we have him, then we will be, we will be our turn again. And they spend their energy crushing whatever remains of Bernie Sanders there. In this way, they are literally prolonging the career of Trump, I claim. Mm. And that was my very cynical reasoning in that quasi support of Trump or whatever. Mm. Uh, I judged, maybe I was wrong on all accounts, it was an empirical judgment. Mm. I, according to my judgment, he is dangerous, but not really as dangerous, you know, some of my leftist friends claim it's fascism now in power. No, this is typical leftist stupidity. Savo, you're, you're wavering off the point. We want to know about your support for Jeremy Corbyn, whose manifesto no, uh, uh, okay, would seem sorry. to be exactly an example of the kind of nostalgic welfare socialism that you've got no time for. His program is a, a rather sort of tawdry, gallimorphy. He's probably super keen on LGBT+. Plus. You know, what is it? Why, not, why are we okay, putting yeah, our yeah. shoulder to the Corbyn wheel here? Tell us why. Because, uh, because nonetheless, uh, even if we don't know, as it were, the final result with what to replace, that's my advice, the system, mm. we should use every opportunity to start battles. For example, and I'm here very open, none of secret Leninist totalitarian dreams. For example, I still think that among a couple of good things that uh, Obama did was Obamacare. This was such a shock for United States. Something so unthinkable that you may remember they dragged him up to... You're back in America again, Slavoj. We have socialized medicine here, and indeed our elections are almost mm, all yeah. about it. No. You're in England. No, Could I'm, you address okay, our, okay, this okay. English audience, please? Okay, I will say it like this. My doubt about Corbyn is double, as far as I know, but I don't know, I must admit it, a lot about it. First... Is there in it anything beyond what you just characterize as this old welfare state nostalgia? Well, I mean, I would bring your characterization on it. I, I mean, I, for my own feeling, my you... problem with Corbyn is uh, that, that uh, he should state his truth, which is if we wish to try and pull Britain out of the neoliberal yeah. globalized economy, that it's going to have to be an autarkist economy pretty much and uh, it's fine guys you can have Jeremy in power and you can have everything in his program and more but you must accept that foreign capital is going to disappear out of the city like water out of a bathtub you've chucked and no, a grenade this in. exactly That's was all. my problem yeah. was my problem with him like something in abstract higher taxes mm. and so on may sound good and under certain conditions it can function it's not a priori excluded by capitalism. Sorry, just a brief detour to the United States. Don't forget that when capitalism was most successful in the United States, the taxes went up to 90, 95%. But in today's global capitalism, it's precisely the problem that you pointed out. It's not only autarky. It's this behind Brexit and so on, this leftist idea of even European Union is an instrument of international capital and so on. So the only way to protect workers' rights and so on is to withdraw into a stronger okay. nation state. Yeah, yeah. I'm totally opposed to it. But, but uh, let's, let's nail you on the, uh, the dreaded and hate feared Euro Eurocentrism, your love of the, of the logos. You know, you feel, reading you, I feel that my head is thrust between Socrates' thighs. You're so in love with the logos. What's so bad about it? Nothing wrong with that at yeah. all! Nothing along, you know, although, yeah. us white... Go to although, oh, do yeah. yeah, 
But you would seem then to be in despair about Brexit and about the way that, that, that Britain is retreating into a kind of keep calm and carry on nostalgic You see, here evocation. you caught me in my ignorance. Mm. If Corbyn really stands for this, mm. then I don't agree with him. Well, the point was he... Because some he, friends are telling me that he doesn't really. Yeah, no, I don't he, know. No, he was basically pro-Brexit but wouldn't admit it. And he was pro-Brexit on that autarkist yeah. welfare socialism nostalgia. No question about no, it. No, my position So you're anti-Corbyn now. You're, you're in this your... sense. Yeah. No, no, no. Wait a minute. Here I'm more of a Stalinist in the sense that it doesn't matter what he thinks. Mm -hmm. What can he do if he... But he will not win if he triggers some... Because, you know, I think we should improvise and try. Mm. Like, for example, my line, who, who, in whom would I put a little bit of trust today? A little bit, not quite. In the guy who was here, I think, a couple of weeks ago, Yanis Varoufakis. Mm -hmm. I have many doubts if his idea of democratizing Europe has any serious meaning at all. The point that I always repeat, and I ask him a couple of times, he didn't get a good question. Is he aware that? concerning Syriza government and concerning refugees, a democratized Europe in the simple sense of Europe where representatives really listen to the voice of the people, mm -hmm. would have been much more rough against the refugees. Mm -hmm. Like if Angela Merkel were well, to say, let's consult the German people, should I invite them? Mm. Out with them and so on. And I'm here for Mar Angela Merkel. So what I'm saying is that, but what uh, Yanis Varoufakis saw clearly is that both choices, capitulation, what Syriza later did, or Grexit, Grexit would have been madness. You know, I learned from my political friends who knew Schäuble, Wolfgang, the mm. German big bad wolf, that he actively wanted Grexit. Mm -hmm. Everything was set in plan. Let Greek have their Grexit. It would be humanitarian catastrophe, chaos, maybe military power, but the left would be learned a lesson for a long time. And what Varoufakis always saw clearly is that it, the only way to fight what we all hate about Europe is through new pan-European or even wider globalism. That's my point. We have to do something. It's clear that there is something wrong with global capitalism, but the way to fight it is not national order. Right, so, so we're just stuffed here in our little island off the coast of Europe then. We can have no impact. Because what I get from the Courage of Hope is on the positive side of mm -hmm. action is you, I'm not saying you dream, but you still hope, the courage of hopelessness, you still hope for uh, a wide popular movement to get going in Europe. I never said white popular movement. I'm well, very you, careful you, here. you talk about things like... I believe like in elites. You, you believe in elites. Absolutely. Yes. But this, wait a minute. All popular movements effectively work like this. You yeah. have an elite. Let's not bullshit That's here. That's your Leninist side. Yeah? Yes. But yeah, you, can, the, you can be also a more The vanguard open. of the revolution? Yeah, but not avant-garde, which then introduces Gulag. But like, you but, always... But these people, should they be in the vanguard of the revolution? It's their problem, not mine. I it's mean, their I, problem? <laughs> yeah. No, no, sorry. But what isn't, are we... Isn't your problem their problem? Sorry? Isn't your problem their problem? No, my problem is I just have a theoretical position. And why, why don't you accept it? I'm not, you see, I'm not saying anything great in every revolution till now, or even progressive movement, it was always a narrow, not, maybe not elite, but maximum 10, 15 percent. And in the luckiest moments, you get a kind of a silent, passive sympathy of the majority. And okay. I'm ready to accept so that's, it. So that's all the, these people are required to do, be a silent passive. No, they are more than welcome to be yeah. active. Why do you read prescription into everything that I say? Because do you agree with my statement? Because if I read your stuff as descriptive, I, it doesn't really take me anywhere. It's the, the ghost of prescriptivism lingering around your prose that draws people to it. I think people do want to hear what your prescriptions are. They don't just want to hear your descriptions, or we just read you as a cultural critic, and you would have no, no tension or significance no, no, as a no. philosopher see, at all. Here we maybe. If perhaps disagree. that's about how you'd like to be read, in which case, fine, you're a cultural critic, and we can just kick it all around and. You know, let's no, watch some that's movies. That's a good point that you make, but let me draw a couple of other distinctions. Let's not worry about the election. Fuck off, let's dance. 
Uh, incidentally, about this now, next but, but month, wait a minute, elections. we're all participating you really? in that systemic violence that you don't like. So, you know, what are we going to do about this, Slavoj? First, these forthcoming elections, mm. since even Corbyn doesn't have a serious chance to win, mm -hmm. I think one should openly say they are pseudo-elections. They have no importance for me. It's not worth your time. Mm. So should we be participating in some other sort of popular movement or should we be seeking out the 15 or 20 percent who will constitute the elite who will then Wait form the revolutionary but you see, vanguard? Here you are fake with this irony of elite and so on. Perhaps Sorry. you can advertising all, guardian all, all, soulmates no, for no. other members of Sorry. the elite. Advertising. Well, perhaps they should advertise in Lonely Hearts columns. I'm a future member of the Leninist elite. Will you meet me outside the Emanuel Center for, uh, now I for, will tell for you good this, fucking? But, okay, uh, uh, but listen, uh, here you are wrong. You know why, I think? Because, but all political movements work like this. What do you want? A really authentic movement where millions would gather and so on. No, they I, don't exist. I want you to address the predicament of a nation in which quite clearly the most, and you write very well on this in The Courage of Hopelessness, you write about how democracy is necessarily a kind of shadow play. It exists in order to facilitate regime change without violence. The important thing you say about democracy is that, that we know that we aren't electing the people who are most suited to do the job. And it's why the ancient Greek system of selecting Locally, leaders yeah, by yeah. lot is in a sense. Yeah, and that, these yeah, points are yeah. all very, very well made. But how do they speak to people who are actually living in this democracy at this moment and who feel that de the democracy is simply not fit for purpose. For example, the Brexit <laughs> remain de uh, declivity cuts completely across traditional right-left uh, a, a traditional right-left axis. So people are confused. I think you are again too activist here. There are first, now I will say something horrible. Man, I've for been at home all day smoking dope and wanking like everybody else. <laughs> No, 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 but yes, because you accept what, like, uh, I don't you know, know what's the mistake? Do you know what is happening today? Do I know what is yes. happening today? I agree with you. I think the light at the end of the tunnel is the approaching train. I agree with you. I, I, and I assume you agree with the International Panel on Climate Change that uh, if there is a 4% or 5% rise mm. in global temperatures by the end of this century, we're all toast, and I don't mean that metaphorically. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you agree with me on that as well. And, but you still seem to, your great belief in the Logos, your great belief in Hegel leads you... No, Hegel was here a total pessimist. Wait a well, minute. Absolutely. Listen, you know what Hegel says? Just take him literally. The all of Minerva wisdom mm. flies uh, off at by dusk. night. At night. Which means none of this revolutionary prediction, we can only retroactively explain what is going on. Hegel was here anti-Marx. Nonetheless, you, you're enough of a Hegelian to evoke the idea of human history as a process that is, is part of a self-organizing and generating principle I wouldn't that is say operating this. What in the I world. would say is that there is some kind of a progress. And mm. in some of my books, I give as an example, I'm very naive here, take the idea of democracy, not in that uh, Chinese, they propagate it now, uh, substantial, deliberative sense, which means you debate, the party keeps all the power, but this, in this radical European sense. This was an incredible progress, something really new emerged. For the first time in the history of humanity, what in usual state regimes is perceived as a moment of crisis. My God, the throne is empty. Here is the basic presupposition. Mm. So the fact that the throne is empty is no longer perceived as nightmare, nightmare. But it's an opening. It means nobody has the full right. To, I, I, I think this, or even with all my mocking human rights and so on. But listen, feminism against slavery and so on and so on. I'm very Eurocentric in a naive sense here. With all the ideological mystifications and so on, this is some progress. Mm. And you know where I have, just allow me this, the problem with you. You say, <laughs> no, no. 
the first is, what do you expect? You know, I'm sorry, I don't... I don't the I, 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 me. Yeah. No, 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 I don't like. I mean, can you imagine me? People wanted me, I got offers to psychoanalyze, to be their analyst. Well, you know, remember the famous story about William Burroughs and Allen Ginsberg, though. Burroughs told Ginsberg, I'm being psychoanalyzed yeah. already, so I'll psychoanalyze you for free. No, no, but my <laughs> point is much more evil. Let's say you were to have trouble and ask me to be your psychoanalyst. I, I would like that, yeah. Yes. No, you know why? Yeah. Because, like, uh, can you really imagine me listening to you and your stupid associations for more than uh, 30 seconds, you know? So I'm not to be your analyst. I'm not interested in, like, I, I'm a sincere misanthropist. Why are you applauding? <laughs> because you shit for brains? No, 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 but let's go back to the point. You know, uh, uh, my position is very modest. Yes, I agree with you. We are in a shitty situation. Mm. There is nothing great to do now, but my pessimism is at the same time a cause of optimism. Don't worry, there will be new crisis. Okay, but you talk about things like... You, and you, I mean this very you, seriously, you, not some distant cope. What will happen with refugees? Yeah, Sam, well, you've got to do better than this, man. You've got to be, do better than these pathetic one-liners. You've got to address things that you say in your book. You, you say that, that, that uh, political change comes from elites. We're not looking to the mass. You talk about international agreements in order to... to no, this is pure you know. logical deduction in the mm. sense of don't you think that, like, problems that we are facing today, mm. even, let's take ecology and so on, mm. this uh, local democracy, non-representative stuff, locally we share what, blah, 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 it's not enough. Mm. It's crucial for or the true horror problem today, the impact of biogenetics, of brain sciences, who will control that and so on, for this, we need even larger than state, strong mechanisms with authority and so on. World government. World communist I, government. No, no, what, you see, what, will be, to, what will it be like living under the world communist government? Okay, Can you give then, us a, you're okay, an imaginative you know, it's guy, the, paint sorry? a little, you're an imaginative guy, paint us a little picture of that future, which you do wave in a diaphanous way around the, the edges of no, your... I, your okay, yes, but you no, okay, but let me return back to you, Look, because you are avoiding... It's so easy, you're, I'm claiming that's my basic premise. Things have terrifying potentials, what is going on today. And uh, it's so easy to say for you elite, but I don't mean elite in the sense of some stupid students meeting halfway between Cambridge and Oxford and so ever. I mean, changes always begin with the minority. Even French revolution, all popular revolutions began with the minority. Yeah, but is it going to begin with a minority of people who really know their Lacan? <laughs> is that where the revolution's going to begin? Well, uh, it's not necessary like this. I never implied this. But why do you have this? You know, my reading of Lacan says this. S strange things are happening today in sexual mores here and there, mm -hmm. the way people relate to authority and so on. Mm -hmm. Which theory can explain this? Why are you blaming me for this? I claim the best that I know is Lacan. Because I can strip out all of the references to Lacan, to Hegel, to Marx and to Freud in your book, The Courage of Hopelessness, and it reads as a series of declarative statements that are your opinions. And I, I don't find that the theory helps to explain your opinions to me, justify your opinions to me, or make them, frankly, any more palatable. So what's it there for, apart I, from I, intellectual okay, grandstanding? We cannot go in detail into it. No, really. What is it there for, apart from intellectual grandstanding? You say you don't believe in the Hegelian idea that, we, that the world spirit is evolving towards some kind of end state. You take a pop at but Marx, Hegel you no longer he's... believe in dialectical materialism. What exactly do you believe in? I be okay. You said you had a problem with belief. I like Lothkrimol's line. Beliefs are ideas going bald. Maybe you just have ideas, no beliefs at all. No, ideas I, are cool. Okay, I put it like this. Allow me to finish. What I believe in is that the global system we are in is approaching some kind of catastrophe, catastrophic okay, potential. Should we understand that in Marxist terms? Is that a series of internal contradictions in yes. the capitalist yes. mode of production? Basically, yes. 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 
So he's, Marx is right about that. About this, yeah. but not in the way he meant it. For example, who would be the working class today? Mm. The problem is that refugees are not authentic but Don't you really think that capitalism is hitting the buffers because we're running out of the earth that we need no, to exploit? No, no, you no, don't. too naive. I think that capitalism has an incredible capacity to change any obstacle to its expansion right, but, into... But, but overall growth rates, for example, uh, in, in economies have been under 3% for many, many years now, but these big Western here economies I, I, were built here on 6 I will be a pro-capitalist and disagree with you. Mm. When I developed this crisis of capitalism uh, two years ago in Korea, they mm. started to laugh at me. Mm. And they said, no, you, Western Europe, are in crisis. Even America is doing better, we are doing better, and so on and mm. so on. So, but no, you know what I'm trying to tell you. Do you agree or not that, for me, the greatest utopia is that things can go on just go on the way they are. I couldn't agree with you more. In 2016 is yeah. when it became clear that that is a, a delusion that is blowing yes. away from okay. people. So what would you do? What would I do? Just, uh, just masturbate, as you said, and sit there. <laughs> no, I think we I, should I, slowly I, at least prepare, organize, think about solutions, and precisely become aware of the crisis we are in. Yes, but, but the basic problem, you know, you know, a transnational agreement between elites to limit the construction of coal-fired yeah. coal power stations, for example, yeah. you really think that the Chinese are going to play ball with that? Uh, no, I, of course I don't, but why... So the now, Chinese wait a minute, are going to do what but the wait Chinese a are going to do? Now you're confusing, I think, so two types of elites. Elites in the usual sense of our power elites, mm. and if anything, now I will shock you with my authoritarian approach, if anything, we are lacking efficient elites today. Mm. Mm. I have more and more the impression that Western Europe and United Kingdom, it's not this old Marxist paranoia So dream. where do we find these elites, Slavoj? The problem for these Western economies is that but their you, own you, power you, you, you is bleeding away. You use in a too narrow way this term elites... Uh, where did, where did communism come? Where does it come? And with all the horrors that it produced, it will emerge. Critical opinion yeah, emerges. Not, you, Maybe it will you, not emerge. You say it yourself in The Courage of Hopelessness that in a large part socialism was an ideology that grew out of the mode of capitalist production in which it found itself. Yeah, which but was, which it was a manufacturing yeah, but economy. Nonetheless, nonetheless. How, are the, how are today's alienated precariat at home in their little cells, yes. clicking away when they're not wanking and smoking dope, like the rest of us. How are they actually going to form the kind of solidarity or the kind of networks, you know, th that uh, are if, going to if, enable uh, them to produce these Because now, elites? even with all the talk about... That, uh, Varoufakis gave a wonderful answer. With all the talk about crisis and so on, in most of Western European countries, we still don't have even an idea what is crisis. Crisis is not if you're standard falls for half a percent. Crisis mm. is what happens in Greece when it fell for 30 percent and so mm. on. And I'm saying, don't you agree that if we both agree with this prediction, we are approaching shit and so on, then that some crisis will explode. What will happen then? Let's begin thinking about that. Well, I think that what will happen then is what always happens, which is that people who are practical and as we say, the English idiom would be handy, will really uh, start to take control at that point. That's it's right. Not and, so and the necessary. people who have been sitting at home reading Lacan are going to be slaughtered in their no. beds. No. <laughs> no, 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 no. You are wrong here. Uh, I think that the danger is of another type. In these difficult situations, it's precisely very non practical in the sense of efficient solutions. Mm. But uh, brutal, pragmatic idealists who can take over. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. it's not that some reasonable British practical mm. people will take over. Right. So I, I return to the, to the idea that always resisted by people who are utopian, mm. which is, you know, what is the ideal that the brutal pra pragmatist will be working towards? What does this future communist society, given our the, the way our relationship with technology, yeah. our relationship with our own sexualities. And to be fair to you, Slavoj, I think you're 
analysis and discussion of LGBT plus is extremely perspicacious. So how are these polymorphously perverse Lacanians mm. going to... How, what are they going to do in this future society? What will its mode of production be? Uh, again... Uh, how will it be governed? Is the state going to wither away? Or, you know, or is no, this brutally no, no, pragmatic no, no. elite going to govern Don't us, forget or? that um, the title of my last sub-chapter in the second chapter of a book about Syriza, mm. a plea for bureaucratic socialism. Yes, yes, you're keen on bureaucratic socialism. Absolutely. And you, you have the lovely line about Kafka and, uh, and uh, bureaucracy and all of that stuff. But what's that going to look like? Is it, I mean, is, we, we, a lot more office work? No, no, no. no. You, you, you listen. Uh, I still claim that with new exploding crises, mm. why are you so ironic here and don't allow that, yes, there will be pragmatists, there will be fascists, already mm. Le Pen and so on are a reaction to crisis. Yeah, not I, your Nigel Farage. I met him once by mistake at BBC. <laughs> he is not your future Führer. He is a clown and so on. So. <laughs> Be afraid of them, but not of Nigel Farage, you know. I don't but what I'm saying is that, why do you a priori exclude that? In the same way it happened in Spain and so on, when people will feel the pressure without reading too much Lacan, yeah, but some, some kind of solution, some kind of radical, more reasonable movement of the left will arise. Right, but I don't exclude but, it. But one of the arguments against Corbyn is that he has been brought to power by kind of collectivists, people who just paid three quid and voted for him in that way. One of the problems, it seems to me, with the socialist project, as I've already mm. said, is that people are not engaged in social modes of production. So how are they to find... You mean find preca precarious and so on. Yeah, exactly. So how are these people to find each other? How are they to join in a, popular, in a, in a movement of some kind? Now, all of that seems startlingly absent from your thinking to me. I'm not looking just for you to advocate somebody we should get behind or something like that. Mm. I'm looking to you for more. As a philosopher, I want you to tell me how to live. I want you to tell me whether I should chuck away my mobile phone because it contains coltan that was uh, obtained mm -hmm. in a, you know, 20 million people have died in the war in the, the Democratic Republic oh, I, of the I, Congo yeah, yeah, in the yeah. last 15 mm -hmm. or 20 years so that we, you can all have your little mobile phones and look at Grinder so you can get bummed later on. <laughs> You know, okay, I mean, okay, uh, now I see all you are saying, but yeah, I think you're that these see ethical, ethical dilemmas are, I think, too naive. Why? Are ethical wh dilemmas are naive? Sorry? How can an ethical dilemma be naive? Things are right naive, and things are wrong? Naive in the sense that you can always isolate for this, for Colton and so on, but... Oh, right, but we, we prefer to dance above that, do we? No, Not bother no, with the messy no, business no, of saying this no. is right and You didn't wrong. answer to my fan. What did you mean exactly by some pragmatist with, look, we are, let's say, approaching some kind of shitty situation. Yeah, and Why the, don't you exclude that? with growing tensions and so on, maybe even precarious people will somehow, I wouldn't exclude it, connect, because remember, who will, miracles do happen, in what sense? Who would have predicted 15 years ago something like Syriza, which screwed it up but won, and so on? Well, I don't think that would be too wild a guess. I think it's a much, much wilder prediction to imagine that the precariat, in a moment of acute social crisis, are somehow going to find the connectivity, the sense of solidarity that is necessary to form a progressive leftist union just no. on, on the spin of a, of a moment when no. other forces are in play. And it seems to me that people who are advocating and believe in some idea of social and political progress and who see this crisis coming should be advocating you know, practical measures, ways of organizing, platforms people can consolidate around, and what sort of ethical attitude they should take towards paying their taxes, contributing to British Aerospace's ability to trade arms to the Saudi Arabians, or the coltan in your pocket that comes from killing people in the Congo. I agree. You should advocate positions on all of that because that's what you but set yourself up to be. But wait a minute. Why do you think that I exclude this? For example, I, I, I was for Obamacare, for all others, and I yeah, agree fine. with all that you said now. You've got socialized medicine here, but we're still helping the Saudis 
drop bombs in Yemen. We've got fantastic yeah, health care. The, 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 I know, yeah. but the contradiction is here, contradiction, uh, antagonism even stronger. Like, what if the money for your uh, NHS system that you still have partially comes precisely from selling arms it to does. Saudi Arabia? It absolutely the does. So what should we do about that ethical dilemma? What should we, what is your answer here? Well, I, I'm not, personally, I'd go private. <laughs> so you, you would go? I'd go private, go to private medicine. No, no I, I, you know what the problem is? Well, for... my position has always been the same. I made a program on the Al Yamama mm. deal 20 years mm. ago. I have consistently opposed the arms trade in this country. I think it's a pile mm. of shit and we shouldn't be in it at all. I think that's an indication that a woman is walking around with a microphone, which means it's time for questions, Slavoj. Um, actually, I can't really see into the house. If there were any way to bring the lights up so, so we could actually see everybody, that would be a real help in terms of taking questions. No? Anyway, questions, please, for, for Slavoj. The microphone is up. I think we'll take them in groups of three, if we could, microphone person. Hello? Can you hear me? We uh, can hear you now. Slavoj, yeah, yeah. you, were, you were talking about... All oh, right, I'll stand up as well. Um, you were talking about genetics. You, you've mentioned that quite a bit recently. Biogenetics, yes. Yeah, biogenetics. Could you maybe expand on what your thoughts are around that area? Okay, I repeat this much so that I don't want to speak too much, but it's very simple. From what I know, and I have connections even in China, not high connections, but some scientists that I met in the United States and so on, well, we should be aware what is already happening. For example, I hope you've read about this, that even Stephen Hawking no longer needs his finger to move his wheelchair. It's already his brain is directly wired and so on, so this prospect of directly connecting our brain to computers is near, it's something that can be done. But are we aware what this means for our, let's call it naively, self-identity? All our minimum of personal dignity and self-identity is based on this, I am here, you are out there, I have my space to think. When this falls, it's not only that I become a little bit like God, like I think about something, it happens. It goes also the other way around. The new ways we can be controlled and so on and so on. And China is for me always the future here. A friend gave me a program of the Brain Sciences Division of Chinese Academy of Sciences. It's a beautiful text because it says there that the task of biogenetics in China is to regulate physical and psychic welfare of Chinese citizens and mm. so on. So I'm just saying that something tremendous, potentially at least, is happening here. And if it's left simply to private companies or to the state or to any combination of both, well, I prefer not to think what can happen. But you think it's fundamentally destructive of, no. of a key notion of human subjectivity? Yeah, but nonetheless, I'm not simply a pessimist. We will be robots or whatever. I think who knows what will happen. Do you not think that our engagement with the web is already altering the ontologic character of human awareness? Yeah, but not quite so much. Although, again, I agree with you here, but it's almost... It fascinates me because we were talking before about death drive and mm. I interpreted it as death drive is really immortality, compulsion to repeat. That's what fascinates me. I can draw very briefly a line here. You know, it all began when I was very young with my love for cartoons. You know, the immortality you find there, Tom and Jerry fighting to death, slicing each other. In the next scene, even if Jerry was cut into pieces, in the next scene, he is already dead. The first man Perhaps who... you think that's what revolutionary violence will be like? No. And no. then they'll all just no, get together no, 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 again no. and be... No, what I'm saying is that this type of, in a way, even primitive, undead subjectivity, it's all again, things go wrong, I can mm. begin again. The father of this is Marquis de Sade. Mm. That's the mystery, Lacan saw it clearly, of the victim, Juliette. She is endlessly tortured, but all the time remains... And 
this is this is how our immersion into digital universe works. Like you know, in, as in a game. And I will say, but these are games. No, love lives. I was told begin to function in the same way. Let's be open. I try with one woman or man. It doesn't work. I erase it. I start again, and so on and so on. This, all this, uh, uh, and also the new modes of control that we have with digitalization. Our Chinese friends again are brave. You know that I read now that in China they already have a plan which is also happening in a subtler way in our countries. The idea is this. All citizens will be registered in some mega computers, which will simply collect data. Did they commit any small crimes, any political crimes? Do they regularly pay taxes, any small criminal acts? Do they read dissident literature? Did they visit Tibet or whatever? And based on this, you will, each one will get in a numeric way a kind of a level of social trust, they call it in this Confucian way. And in a more refined way, we are doing it. So who will control all, who will control all this and so on? I, I think that, uh, I think that, uh, and again, I refuse to be simply an old-fashioned humanist here, you know. Everything is lost, we will lose our individuality. No, we have to admit that we don't know what is here, but we should follow it closely. So what's your position here? What would you have done? Do you know something more? What would, what I, what would I have done? Not you, I, but I like, think, what's your opinion? About I think technology is something that happens to humans. It's not something that humans do. It's a, it's a complete misconstrual. Yeah. And, uh, and, and what will be, will be. But without the collapse, without a major collapse in our civilization, yeah. it seems to me indisputable that the beginning of human machine transhumanist existence is already underway it's and, and, underway, and, it's, and it's ineluctable and i follow yes, but people you know like what's Gregory my problem Bateson after reading some... people all these transhumanist idealists like ray mm. kurzweil mm. and so on is that they ontologically cheat because they describe this new superhuman singularity but as if they imply it, they don't say it. At the same time, it keeps all our properties, free thinking and yeah, so on. Yeah, but they project onto it their own yeah, human, yeah. humanist delusions about yeah, what it might be like. but on the other hand, like. I don't want to be in a too abstract way a pessimist, but at some point I agree with you. Mm. We should become aware to what extent what appears as our human limitations, mortality, ambiguity of language, and so on, is not simply imperfection, but sustains the space of our, whatever you call it, creativity, and so on, and so on. Also, I think we're much too hung up on, uh, on autonomy and on the idea of the discrete psyche anyway. It has always struck, it strikes me that consciousness is much more of a collective phenomenon than we dare allow. Here, For example, I know exactly what you're thinking. All right, could we take another question? You cannot, because, yeah. you know, to bring out what I'm thinking, you would need not three axes of hardcore, but no, five axes. It, it's axis. just because okay. you've written so many bloody books. All right, yeah. could we have another question, please? Hello. Thanks for listening. This question is for everybody, and both of you. I'm over here on your yeah. left. So... Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's not unrelated. So, do you agree that... A political system like capitalism is a data processing system style. Like, Sorry, is, a is a data. Do you be, do you believe that? And if so, do you think that the next changes in data processing that are so huge mm. will be more of a centralized political system with everybody's data? Much because technology is moving much faster than politics, it will continue to do so so much more. So I'm glad you started talking about it already. Here I'm more skeptical, you know, in what sense? That uh, I still believe, maybe here I'm old-fashioned, even humanist or what, that technology doesn't stand of its own. It always relies on, implies certain social relations of power and so on and so on. Today's digital system is not simply a natural property of a certain technology. It's always... Uh, embedded in set of capitalist relations and so on and so on. What do you think capitalism is, Slavoj? 
oh, here I'm a good Marxist, which means although I'm critical of it, I think it's a miracle. It's absolutely the most dynamic uh, uh, economic system that humanity ever knew, because the genius of capitalism is this one. You must know this, that how, uh, you know, Marxists are always expecting, you know, like Mao said, late, uh, no, sorry, uh, Marx, late 19th century capitalism is approaching its final crisis. Then mm -hmm. Lenin said imperialism, the final stage of capitalism. Then Mao said 40 years later, American imperialism, this rotting last stage is getting even more rotten and so on. Okay, it's rotting, rotting, and the more it's rotting and in decay, the more it's, the better it's functioning mm -hmm. in some sense. So what I'm saying is that never forget and this would have been my criticism of generally Heideggerian approach. When we talk about technology today, it's not abstract technology. It's technology the way it was generated and sustained by capitalism. And as you pointed out, my critique of traditional Marxism is that it cheated ontologically. It wanted to get rid of capital, but to retain all the dynamics of always overcoming, getting over, which for me is deeply embedded precisely in capitalist uh, dynamics, you know. But here I see the paradoxes today, my reason of my pessimism. Isn't it the ultimate irony that, okay, even if Fukuyama was right, you no, know, like uh, capitalism won, that today almost I'm tempted to say that one among, at least, the best managers of capitalism are ex-communists where they are still in power. I always think that you, you, you conflate two things and, ah. and people who are influenced by Marxist yeah. philosophy oh, tend yeah. to conflate two things when they look at capitalism. Well, capitalism isn't an ideology. It has ideologies associated with it, nor exactly is it a mode of production. But Should, it's a tool. The tool. It's a tool. Capitalism is a tool. What do we mean by this? It's a way of effecting change at a distance, like any other tool. Yeah, but tool. nonetheless, I would say it's not a tool in the sense we usually understand a tool. Like now, if I have to be camera, no, I will chop I, your head. It's I'm, not... I'm, no, no, it's no, a certain, no, 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 no I think it's a certain social think mechanism. Of, think of what, Greg, what Gregory Bateson says. You know, if, if the axe is the tool, then the man's arm is the tool. And if the man's arm is the tool, then the man standing on the earth is part of the tool, and so is the tree that he's chopping. I don't get, uh, but I think, nonetheless, all this complex can be part of a certain mechanism. No, but I think the problem for you, Marxists, is you're always identifying capitalism as if it were an ideology. It's not an ideology, it's just what people do, which is why all no, these no, good oh, leftists oh, 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 have their no. mobile here, phones I'm with so their demo, sad, with I'm their so sad we disagree pocket. here, because here I claim that precisely the greatness of Marx was that he wasn't a simple vulgar materialist. You know, ideology is just a mirror, real things. No, he's a materialist can... monist. Sorry? Like, oh, he's a materialist monist. Not just monist, but he saw clearly that, and that's why, we don't have time to go now into it, when he developed his notion of commodity fetishism, it's clearly that he speaks about an ideology, but he never calls it ideology because it's not superstructure. It's in the very heart of economic structure of capitalism. And uh, capitalism is outside ideology in the sense of outside all cultural identity. That's the miracle of capitalism today. You can get, uh, uh, you can get I don't know, a Tibetan, a Chinese, a Latino American, that's because it's just what people do, Slavoj. Okay, yeah, but what people do is structure through, through fantasies and fictions. That I would insist. Let's have another question before we all die. Hey. Uh, first, <laughs> first uh, I, I'd like to uh, uh, say something to Will Self, and I will give a question for uh, Professor Zizek. No, you can question him a little bit. No okay, problem. Okay, okay, okay. So the thing is, like you question about like Zizek's position on like... Uh, we should think. But the point is, let me give a Marx, uh, quote from Karl Marx. The point of to know about the world is to change it. Because while we were knowing it, we, we, already made, we, we are already making the change, and this is a, a dialectic. So I think the problem that, uh, from the GX position is that, that people really have is we should be uh, confused, but we're not. And this is 
in yes, my opinion, I agree the with this last formulation. Uh, catastrophe. So I think Zizek also at this book is very authentic here because the point in my, uh, the way I understand it is like the confusion itself is a stage of transformation. Uh, well, yeah, so the question for Zizek is that uh, what, like we, you talk about we should sit and think, and I'm thinking about like a very daring proposition that maybe are we going to move on to a new age, another age of philosophy in the future? Uh, because from my personal uh, empirical experience, I think it is quite demanding, but is it really, uh, I mean, what is, in your opinion, the biggest uh, 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 re resistance for it? Okay. Sorry, resistance of whom against what? <laughs> what? Yeah, I know, that was a bit of a sort of strange cutoff point there. Oh, but, sorry. <laughs> but I think, I think what he was driving at is, is what is the resistance to this new point of change? What are the forces that are ranged? Is that what you were driving at? Yeah, something like that. Which new point? The point where capitalism mm. is moving or...? Well, what is, what is resisting the point at which we're going to get some clarity of thought on these issues? You know, what is resisting... Uh, no, our... here, my God, I am a Marxist in the sense that, you know, the problem is this one, is not simply knowing, but because the greatness of Marx, Marx is implicit, not what he often said. Theory of ideology is that... Uh, like, we can know something. That's for me, as I repeatedly wrote in my book, is the problem of ideology today. You can know, like most of the people know, at least rationally, about ecological threat. Mm. But they don't take it seriously. Mm. They don't believe it, really. Mm. I don't think that we really believe there is a threat, and so on. Mm. So my point is this one, that in a way, Knowing, I'm not simply preaching sit and learn, because knowing about things is also a way of not doing it, of, you know, like, mm. I know it, and so on. There is wrong and false knowledge, not at the simple level of it reflects truth, or, but how it practically uh, engages you. What you said about uh, philosophy and so on, here, very naively, yes, I, I agree with you, in the sense that, I think that in this new age, ecological threats, biogenetics, digitalization, and so on, the very basic definitions of what is a human being will change. That's it. That's it. That's the cut-off line. Stalinist. There's a woman Stalinist. on the side of the Stalinist. stage going like this. Thank you so much, Savoy. Thank you. Thank you.